Pony Pals number 17, Detective Pony. Chapter 1, A Visitor. Anna Harley came out her back door and ran across the backyard. There were two ponies in the paddock behind Anna's house and yard. Hey, ponies, Anna called out. We're going for a trail ride. As she prepared the noose adroitly. Anna's pony, Acorn, was standing in the pony shed. The other pony, Little no Sebastian, one, belonged to Anna's next-door neighbor and pony pal, The Lily city Sanders. of Pawnee, Indiana. Little Snow Seb White came over to Anna, but Acorn stayed in the shed. Anna thought that Acorn was trying to hide from her. He liked to play... I, I'm scared shitless of my master. Anna went into the shed. Acorn wasn't... Plucking around. He was staring at a fluffy black cat with white paws... Taking a dump on his favorite saddle. The cat was staring back at Acorn. Shitting like tomorrow wasn't a thing. Hey, kitty, said Anna. What are you doing here? She asked. The act of defecation oddly farmed the girl. Pawnee came into the shed behind Anna. Whose cat is that? The rural township inquired. I don't know, answered Anna. It's not a pony, so who seriously gives a fuck? Suddenly, a mouse ran from behind the feed bin. The contrived incident caused some extra shit to happen. Acorn was like, oh, hell no, not the fuck in my paddock, bitch. Acorn nickered as if to say, vile slurs emitted. The cat leaped back up on the straw and curled himself into a ball. Acorn took a few steps toward the cat and crushed it to death with his magnificent hooves. Acorn nickered triumphantly. That's so cute, murmured the fictional Midwestern burrow. Pam Crandall rode another goddamn pony up to the shed. She said hi to her pony pals and, and the whole crew beamed complacently about their bullshit horse club. Anna pointed at the cat. Acorn has a new, new kind of meat he appears to tolerate, she exploded. But we don't know where the most succulent portions are. Or who gets the wishbone, said Pawnee. Do you? Pam picked up the, the body and looked the jellified carcass over. over. The body without the soul is just matter, she said. Do you think there's an afterlife? asked Anna. He doesn't have a collar, said Pam. So there's nothing to loot from the corpse. The avaricious girl sighed dejectedly. We should make a poster saying we found him, said Anna, just in case someone needs a dead cat for a satanic ritual. Are we the fucking feline friends, said Pony? No, we're the pony pals. So let's stop dicking around with non-equines and ride some fucking horses. Let's go for a trail ride, snorted Pam. If he's still dead when we come back, we'll make a poster. Anna and Pawnee agreed with Pam. They saddled up their ponies and mounted. The cat began the slow process of decomposition. Bye, kitty, said Anna. It's time for you to go to your maker and be judged for your sins. The Pony Pals rode across the paddock on the Pony Pal Trail. The rest of the town called it the those fucking kids who won't keep their mouths shut about ponies for five goddamn minutes no matter how much we beat them trail. Anna and her pals loved riding on Pony Pal Trail. No school for a whole week, Anna shouted. I, I knew framing our teacher for arson was a good idea. We're going to have so much heroin, Pam said. Look, Anna, Pawnee called. The cat came back to life. At first, Anna and Pam thought Pawnee was just drunk. She had a serious problem. Anna turned and saw the cat running along the trail behind them. Acorn saw him, too. He, he wondered if it was a projection of his murder-burdened conscience. Killing was not foreign to Acorn, quite the contrary. So why only now, after countless other homicides, would a victim come back to haunt him? Acorn, for the first time in centuries, was afraid. Anna slowed Acorn to a halt at three birch trees. The cat ran up one of the trees and sat on a limb near Acorn's face. Acorn examined it, his dead black eyes like pools of ichor bled by the nameless thousand-tongued beast, whose awakening will cause the land to crumble, the sea to boil, and the sky to shit itself in fear. This cat really likes Acorn, said Anna. Maybe we should bring the cat to your father, said Pawnee. He might know what kind of black magic is at play here. Good idea, said Anna, as she took a swig of whiskey from her jewel-encrusted flask. Pam's father was a veterinarian, and he took care of most of the cats, dogs, horses, manticores, and pigs in Wiggins. He spent the majority of his time, however, thinking about what a goddamn stupid name Wiggins is for a town. Fuck you, Jean Betancourt. 
He has office hours this morning, said Pam, so we should go right now. The others agreed once Pam drew her pistol on them. The cat followed the pony pals to the animal clinic. They put their ponies in the paddock. Jesus Christ, they love ponies so fucking much. Anna in the fictional town picked up the cat and the two girls went into the clinic waiting room. A man sat in one of the orange plastic chairs. A German in World War I era soldier sat at his feet. Pam patted the German an infantryman's head. How you doing, Brandy? she asked the trout. Brandy sniffed Pam's hand to check if she was carrying a canister of mustard gas. He's having an operation today, the man told Pam. He has to stay overnight in the re-education room. He has committed horrible war crimes. Dr. Crandall came to the door of the waiting area. He was dismayed to see the pony pals there. Pam told him how they found the true meaning of Christmas. Brandy disdainfully humped Dr. Crandall's leg. I'll look at the cat after I put Brandy in the interrogation cells, said Dr. Crandall. The man and Brandy followed Dr. Crandall into the back of the clinic. The screams began almost instantly. A few minutes later, the Pony Pals were in Dr. Crandall's examining room. He put the cat on the examining table and readied his holy water and crucifix. I've never seen the film Titanic, Dr. Crandall said, but I can tell you Leonardo DiCaprio lived outdoors all his life. Leo doesn't have any scars and has eaten well. He's also been altered. Claire Danes definitely, definitely had chemistry with him in Romeo and Juliet. Dr. Crandall listened to the cat's heart and lungs with his stethoscope. This cat has no heartbeat. It is not of this world, he said. He handed the cat back to Anna. I'm going to sacrifice some goats to him because I am fucking terrified. This is such a bullshit animal. He opened a drawer and took out a, a rusty music box. Anna held the cat while Dr. Crandall gave, gave the wind-up key to his daughter. It's finally time for you to take this, Pam. You'll know when and how to use it. I'm sorry that this burden is now yours. We're going to make posters about the cat, Anna told him. This fucker is distracting us from our horse-related shit, so unless someone claims him, we'll have to take matters into our own hands. Good idea, said Dr. Crandall. He can sleep in the kennel tonight. I have, have an enema scheduled soon. Goodbye. Thanks, Dr. Crandall, Pawnee whispered huskily. The pony pal said a word so foul I cannot bear to repeat it to Dr. Crandall and brought the cat back outside. Anna put him on the ground. The cat melted through the paddock fence and over to Acorn. Acorn inwardly freaked the fuck out, but managed to keep it together. That is such a horrifying cat, said Anna. I wish Acorn and I could be free of him and his curse. Maybe nobody will claim him, said Pam. Then you could finally test your new guillotine. That would be so much fun, said Pawnee. I can't kill the cat, said Anna sadly. My mother says it's a sin to kill anything other than a human. If we can't give him away, we'll have to suffer his sorcery long after we're all in the grave, she shuddered. The wind. Do you hear it, Pam? Oh, that we're blowing more fortuitous tidings our way instead of this rank scud of feculence. I age, I fear, and I fear my aging. Would that that cat's innocence were mine. Too bad, Pawnee sighed. He's such an evil fucking cat. I hope someone claims him, said Pam. The cat jumped up on the highest fence rail and started shitting again. Acorn and the cat locked eyes, knowing that soon the battle between them would begin, and that at its conclusion, something surely would be destroyed. Maybe one of them, maybe both. Maybe the entire world. Anna wondered what would happen to Acorn's great new friend. Chapter 1. Finn Detective Pony was originally written by Gene Betancourt. The first two pages were altered by Andrew Hussey, pretending to be Dirk Strider. The rest of the pages were altered by Sonnet Stuck, also pretending to be Dirk Strider. The book is read by Duckface as yet another person pretending to be Dirk Strider, and Naked Bee as Gene Betancourt, a fourth character who may or may not be Dirk Strider. This recording was instigated, perpetrated, and assembled by Naked Bee.